The media's account was inflammatory. The New York Post reported that the students were in possession of, quote, the writings of Che Guevara, quotations from Mao Zedong, and a typewritten document entitled Blueprint for Campus Revolt. The Daily News also tried to stoke fears of communism, declaring that, quote, 122 detectives making pre-dawn arrests in four boroughs found inflammatory writings of Chinese and Cuban communists. This media frame exacerbated the powerful stigma of criminal prosecution in the eyes of the broader public. But closer to home, the arrest backfired, generating greater support for black from both the campus and community. Black leaders in particular stepped up. The black community really got together to support us, Davis said. Attorneys George Wade and Ray Williams argued before Judge Dominic Rinaldi that the bail was punitive. Williams also pointed to the racial bias in the arrest, noting that, quote, there were SDS students involved, but they were not brought in because they were white. The judge accused him of, 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 of racism by making that statement and told him to be quiet. The appellate division ordered the bail reduced to $6,500. U.S. Representative Shirley Chisholm, herself a Brooklyn College graduate, raised the bail money. She convinced Dr. Thomas Matthew to put up his share of Interfaith Hospital, a drug treatment clinic in Queens, as collateral. And she got Reverend William A. Jones of Bethany Baptist Church to put up his church. And, 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 and I would just add a little note here, too, about Shirley Chisholm in this period. Um, as a result of the sort of nationwide upsurge of student protests, there were lots of uh, anger in Congress, and they wanted to crack down on the students and withhold and deny financial aid and any other kind of punitive measures that was, that was in their control. And Shirley Chisholm played an important role, particularly in 1969 and 1970, of trying to articulate and translate this radical student generation to her colleagues in Congress. And she and others were ultimately able to prevail in terms of preventing them from enacting these more punitive measures to crack down on the students. So she was an important, I think, um, uh, bridge and sort of an intergenerational divide in trying to articulate uh, this kind of black power uh, generation, student generation, uh, to members of Congress in Washington. She really saw her role as to protect them. And, and I think she did that in this, in this case. As it turns out, the criminal case never went anywhere. The state never produced any evidence. And after about a year of delay and negotiation, the attorneys and judge reached a deal in which the students accepted a short probationary period and the charges were dismissed and the students' records ultimately expunged. The Kingsman, the campus newspaper, editorialized that the pro probationary period, quote, seems suspiciously like a move to repress dissent on campus, since the 19 are not guilty enough to be prosecuted. After the arrest, and the stationing of 100 police officers on campus, a large group of students and faculty went on strike. Their demands were drop the charges against the BC-19, implement the 18 demands, and get the police off campus. This again was a very classic move that was uh, 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 repeated nationwide where the administration kind of overreacts brings the police on campus, and that causes the kind of liberal or moderate group of students, faculty, to kind of ally with the radicals. Um, and that's kind of what happened here. Askia Davis said he didn't realize how much support they had from the majority white campus until this point. The Kingsman editorialized in support, quote, the 20 arrests on Tuesday morning were conducted in a manner that heaped disgrace on the American legal system and added to many students' hatred and distrust of the New York City police. So that's not a new phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> the student uprisings across the city induced the Board of Higher Education to accelerate and broaden an open admissions plan slated to begin in 1975. And here I'll just note briefly that, that Brooklyn was not the only CUNY campus that was engaging uh, in this kind of protest. Every single division of CUNY uh, was really, uh, the students were, were up in arms in the spring of 1969. It was the high watermark of the student movement nationally, and this was happening at Hunter, at, at City, uh, really all over. At City, you know, in an extraordinary way, right? That's, this, but really, the struggle at City College has gotten, I think, more attention, and that's one reason I wanted to talk about Brooklyn, because Brooklyn's been kind of neglected um, uh, uh, in favor of City College. The original plan, the original open admissions plan, was to assign most high school graduates to community colleges rather than the four-year or senior colleges. But student protest 
one, a much larger number of slots at the senior colleges and moved up its launch to 1970. The students had not led the call for open admissions, but their support for quotas to increase the black and Puerto Rican student population had inspired intense opposition. The tendency by many to credit or blame the city college protest for the onset of open admissions has worked to suppress an acknowledgement of the significance of the struggle at Brooklyn College. But the students here achieved a great deal. Quote, we were responsible for changing the climate of the campus, says Orlando Pyle, now a physician. After open admissions, the number of black and Puerto Rican students rose significantly. But as Askia Davis underscored, it wasn't just blacks and Latinos who benefited from open admissions. A lot of working class whites had been shut out too. Other reforms included the establishment of an Afro-American Studies Institute and a Puerto Rican Studies Institute, which later became departments. Significant changes in required courses and more black and Puerto Rican counselors and other professional staff. The impact of open admissions was stunning. 35,000 freshmen entered CUNY campuses in 1970, a 75% increase from 1969. One quarter of these entering students were black or Latino. After open admissions, 75% of New York City high school graduates attended college, a rate well ahead of the national average. But in a fateful conjuncture, open admissions coincided with the city's fiscal crisis. There was a sharp drop in funding just when CUNY needed it most, helping to make the discourse of failure shrouding open admissions a self-fulfilling prophecy. The severe budget cuts climaxed in, quote, the retrenchment of 1976, when the state of New York took over the city of New York, uh, the City University of New York, laid off many faculty, and imposed tuition for the first time. By 1998, Republican Mayor Rudolph Giuliani declared open enrollment is a failure. And the CUNY Board of Trustees replaced it with standardized tests for admissions and, and eliminated all remedial courses from the senior colleges. This discourse of failure obscures the fact that a generation of lawyers, civil servants, teachers, artists, and social workers in New York City got their start through open admissions notwithstanding its severe underfunding and other flaws. Black and Puerto Rican college students in the late 1960s rejected market-driven approaches to higher education. They insisted upon the right of working class African Americans and Puerto Ricans to receive the benefits of public higher education in New York City. And I think today, as we continue to face these questions of access and affordability in higher education, we can learn a lot from their insights, examples, and struggles of many years ago.